So our next presentation will focus on current therapies in aphasia. And we're very lucky to have two presenters on this topic this afternoon. Virginia Agosti, who you met earlier today, uh, and who is the Neurological Co Coordinator from Metro Rehab. And she'll be joined by Vanessa Aratia, a Senior path Speech Pathologist from Royal Rehab. Virginia was welcomed to Metro Rehab Hospital as the neuro Neurological Stroke Coordinator earlier this year. She supports stroke survivors before, during and after their hospitalisation. Virginia trained as a speech pathologist and has over nine years experience working with adults in acute care, rehabilitation and in community health with a focus on neurological conditions. She has also experience in, sorry, she has also experience in health services management, NDIS and education. Virginia enjoys educating and empowering stroke survivors, their families and communities to support each other to work to, to work towards achieving their goals. Joining Virginia today is Vanessa Ararati. Vanessa is a speech pathologist with over seven years experience working with neurological rehab. She's been working at Re Royal Rehab for the past five years across all services. Vanessa has experience with adults in inpatient rehabilitation, community services and palliative care. And lately she's been involved with the sexuality clinic at Royal Rehab. Her passion is to support stroke survivors in their rehabilitation journey and educating an evidence-based intervention so that they can achieve their personal goals. Please join me in welcoming Virginia and Vanessa for their presentation on current aphasia therapies. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Michelle, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thank you to you all uh, with the Stroke Recovery Association and everyone present today. It's been a great conference so far. Uh, so as Michelle was saying, we're going to be discussing current aphasia therapies today. Uh, uh, now I'm from Metro Rehab, Vanessa is from Royal Rehab. So for those of you who don't already know, Metro Rehab is now proudly owned by Royal Rehab. So before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to elders past, present and future and extend our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So today we'll be discussing aphasia after stroke, current guidelines and therapies, holistic programs, new technologies, and support services and resources. You may have noticed my slides are a little bit different. So we're going to use best information for aphasia techniques. So short, simple sentences, interesting and relevant content, hopefully, using key words in bold, including clear pictures and labels. But just know that for people with aphasia, it's important to adapt communication to each individual's needs. So, Isabella Christo spoke a little bit earlier about aphasia. So a brief recap. Aphasia is pronounced aphasia. Up to 38% of stroke survivors may experience aphasia. It's a communication difficulty, not an intelligence difficulty. So individuals may experience difficulty with listening, speaking, reading, and or writing, or a combination. Difficulty communicating impacts health, family, work, and our social lives. The clinical guidelines for stroke management recommend that for best practice care, 
individuals or stroke survivors with aphasia receive speech and language therapy to improve their function. It's also recommended that aphasia therapy should be intensive. So at least 45 minutes of direct language therapy for five days a week. This is especially important in the first few months after stroke. Looking at the research, it's difficult to make general conclusions for people with aphasia, as treatments and research methods tend to be very different. Treatment for people with aphasia is always personalised. This means there are many case studies. This is changing and more research is being done on therapies that are delivered in a similar way for a lot of people. Now, there are many therapies, many, many, many. There's no time to discuss them all today. We will focus on speaking therapies today. There are two main types, impairment based therapies, which fix what is broken. They're a direct treatment of speaking, reading, writing or listening. The second is consequence based therapies. So they support the skills that are intact. They're indirect treatments that adapt the environment, communication partners, or equipment used to communicate. So one of the current therapies, an impairment based therapy, is constraint induced aphasia therapy. It focuses on speech and takes away the gestures or the aided systems like a speech generating device. Constraint induced aphasia therapy. Now there's significant effect uh, on systematic review on speaking and naming. It may also improve comprehension, so understanding, repetition, and writing. How does it work? It's based on constraint induced movement therapy, which is a physical therapy for paralysis or weakness. In occupational therapy, for example, the good hand is covered by an oven mitt and the stroke survivor needs to use needs to use the impaired arm. In aphasia, one type of communication is stopped, forcing the stroke survivor to practice another. So gesture is stopped, so a person needs to find words to speak to communicate. <clears throat> An example is the go fish game. So people cannot see each other's cards, and the stroke survivor needs to use speech only to request a card. They start simple and build up. So they may ask for a pick a card with a ball, then red ball, the red ball, I want the red ball. Okay, lots and lots of repetition. And that repeated practice is important to build the speech skills. So some ticks and tricks. It's good in groups and with family. So get that competitive spirit going and also facilitate social participation. If it's difficult for people to do in person because they're gesturing, try over the phone or on Zoom with the camera off. It's important that the pictures are interesting and relevant to the stroke survivor's goals. So if they're a chef, maybe use some pictures of meals. And there are some versions, uh, so constraint induced aphasia therapy plus, where it includes written cues. 
so some some cues that the stroke survivor can read and some home practice. Now, most therapies actually are multimodal. So that means they use a combination of gesture, drawing, reading, writing, listening, and speech all together. They use the strengths, so what is intact, to support or improve weaknesses. A lot of people ask me about brain stimulation. So that's therapy that focuses on using electrodes or magnets to activate parts of the brain. Now there is research that it can be done without, before, or during normal language therapies. This is not currently recommended, but it's under review with the Stroke Foundation. On systematic review, there was significant effect on naming objects, so naming some words, but no significant effect on naming doing words or going into everyday communication. So more research is needed. It is being debated. So some um, reviews say that brain stimulation is effective. And there are different opinions on how long it might last. At the end of the day, more research is required. So now we're moving on to consequence-based therapy, which supports skills that are intact. So communication partner training is a treatment approach targeted at communication partners, including family members, friends, carers, and of course, the person with aphasia. It teaches communication partners how to best support conversation and interaction for a person with aphasia to improve language, communication, participation, and or quality of life. In terms of the evidence, a systematic review found that communication partner training is effective in improving communication activities and or participation of individuals with chronic aphasia when they interact with trained communication partners. As you can see here, the stroke guidelines also recommend communication partner training as part of best practice care. So how does it work? The methods are varied and they all include education, practice, building skills, and feedback and self-evaluation. So some tips and tricks, um, reduce background noise and look at the person when you speak to them. Give them time to think and talk. Don't speak for them or correct their errors. Simplify your message. Rephrase or repeat a word or a sentence when needed and encourage the use of total communication. Now, Augmentative and Alternative Communication, AAC. This is a therapy approach that focuses on multimodal communication and the individual's full communication ability. It might include speech, gestures, and aided communication. In terms of the evidence, two systematic reviews found that AAC is effective and it might be useful to improve communication and social participation regardless of the type and degree of the impairment. The stroke guidelines also recommend the use of AAC as part of best practice. So 
How does it work? It supports and increases the individual's ability to participate and communicate in different environments. The speech pathologist considers all available options for AAC, including a native AAC, like vocalizations, gestures, manual signs, and body language, an aided AAC, which can be divided into low technology systems, such as object symbols, communication boards and books, and high technology, such as speech generating devices. Some tips and tricks, um, use gestures, write the main word, draw a picture, use familiar prompts like photos, music, pets and objects, encourage any attempt at communication, and discuss the options with your speech pathologist. Holistic programs. Um, intensive comprehensive aphasia programs are well-rounded programs that consider the whole person. And they are based on the international classification of functioning, disability and health, ICF, they include blocks of daily therapy that focus on speech, manual, aided systems, and partners, but also focus on homework on computer, stroke education, goals, and mental health. These programs have been found to be effective but more research is required. They have, they have been found to be effective for groups, but not for all individuals. It's difficult to identify the helpful factors. Now, during COVID-19, telehealth has become more common for people with aphasia. So this is speech therapy on the phone or on the computer. It's supported by our national organisation, Speech Pathology Australia. So systematic reviews have found that telehealth is effective. Um, there's no significant difference in the outcomes between telehealth and face-to-face -face therapy but more research is needed on individual therapy approaches. There are new technologies emerging. So for example, virtual reality for aphasia. There's an online place called Eva Park that you can see there on your screen. Eva Park is an online world designed with stroke survivors. Clients meet each other and therapists online. Now the evidence on this is mixed. Uh, so in some cases it improves naming, um, but they're working on seeing how it goes for naming, sentences, storytelling and everyday communication. There are also robot assistants like this creepy little guy from Germany um, that have been programmed to deliver aphasia therapy. They won't be replacing speech pathologists anytime soon, I hope. This guy has been programmed with um, a protocol put in place by a speech pathologist. What are speech pathologists? Health professionals with a university degree, they can improve communication and swallowing and work in hospitals like us, aged care, schools, universities and in the community. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about communication partner training and practice uh, at home, 
there are some websites here uh, that are very, very helpful. The Stroke Recovery Association is a great place to go for support, as is the Australian Aphasia Association. For aphasia groups near you, you can go to the website on the screen. And the Stroke Foundation also provides some support. And then we have a lot, a lot, a lot of references. Just click through them very quickly. I wasn't joking. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will get the hang of this technology by the end of the day, I have no doubt. But thank you very much. That was a great um, comprehensive um, uh, breakdown on the, the various therapies that are available for um, stroke survivors um, after their stroke and going home as well into the community. So just a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, since there are so many types of therapy for people with aphasia, how do you decide which one is best for yourself or your patient? Um, Vanessa? Yeah, I'll answer that question. Um, I guess the best um, starting point is to com complete a comprehensive assessment. Um, that will tell us the the client's weaknesses um, and also their strengths. Um, we, after the assessment and once we get the results, I would usually have a conversation with the client um, and the loved ones to discuss the goals. And then once we have goals, I think then we can start thinking about which therapy approach is best for them and that would um, allow them to achieve their goals. I'm sorry, it's not a straight answer. I cannot. No, um, sorry. I'm just reading one. the other questions and there's a bit of a lag. My apologies for that. Okay. So my next question is, um, are you personally finding that telehealth is as effective as face-to-face -face therapy? I think it really varies. So in my experience, uh, depending on a number of factors, so the person with aphasia's preferences, uh, the type of therapy being delivered, uh, and both the clinician or the students and the person with aphasia's ability to utilize technology, all of these factors play into the success of the therapy approach. Going forward. Excellent. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on the use of choirs in the development of speech um, post-stroke, um, because it's one of the things that uh, we at the association offer um, both online and when um, COVID um, goes away, let's hope, um, we, we also have some face-to-face -face choirs, both in the city areas and also in rural areas. So I was wondering if either of you would like to comment on the value of stroke choirs for people to develop their speech going forward. Look, I, I find that stroke choirs are valuable for a number of reasons. Uh, it's not just development of speech. So we know that basically music uh, crosses both hemispheres in the brain. OK, so it, it helps us to reforge language pathways to help us with our speech. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from the speech component, there's also the social component. There's also linking into other people and other people, other stroke survivors. Have the benefit of their experience that they can share with each other. So, go Ex ahead, Michelle. Excellent. Um, there's an, also a question here that says, can you recommend any cognitive assessment for stroke survivors with aphasia? Mm. So, um, yeah, so I guess the speech pathologist, um, we usually assess language. 
we also assess, assess cognition, um, how cognition impacts on communication. Pure cognitive assessments, I think occupational therapies would be the best um, to give you that answer. I know of the MOCA. Um, but in terms of cognitive communication, how cognition impacts on communication, I like to use the MCLA, which is a very comprehensive assessment um, in terms of language, I guess the WAB, the Western Aphasia um, Battery also is quite good. And there, okay. are, there are many, many. I do have a comment here that says, thank you for the aphasia friendly way you presented and are the guidelines, which you are obviously very clear on, available to speakers in the future? Um, because I guess it's one of the things that um, our members who um, struggle with, I, I guess the way we present some of our conferences and some of the way our speakers, um, I guess present, including myself, I might add, is, um, you know, are they available so we could, I guess, utilise them for our, our speakers in future conference? I'm happy to, to send those through to you, for sure. Okay. Um, and another question that says, where do you see aphasia therapies going in, in the future as technology advances? Look, I'm excited. I'm really excited. There's a lot already out there. So in terms of speech generating devices, um, environmental control units, um, so what a lot of us, not me, but a lot of people have in their homes that control every aspect of the home. Um, people with aphasia um, can have access to those that helps them around the home, even if they have physical impairments as well. Right. Okay, and and I guess my other question is, um, speech is a, a huge issue for for people as um, as as part of um, connecting uh, in a social environment. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether or not you have any comment about um, aphasia friendly groups and uh, stroke support groups providing that sort of atmosphere and availability to people um, to practice their speech in a in a supported environment. Hmm. Um, so before COVID, there were quite a few groups run by different hospitals and also organizations like the Stroke Recovery Association or the or Aphasia Association. Unfortunately, in the current climate, I, there's only a few that are still running. Luckily, we still have the Stroke Recovery um, group um, that helps, you know, stroke survivors. And also the Aphasia um, Association is running a group targeting um, it's it's more like a social avenue for people to practice conversing and socialising. So that's still current and is run online. And my next question, I guess, is how long after um, uh, somebody has experienced a stroke, do you feel they can benefit from speech pathology going forward and whether or not changing from one of the treatments that you talked about to another may give somebody a bit of a kick along with their speech? Yeah, so look, in my experience, if you have a communication related goal, it's always good to seek out a speech pathologist. You're okay. correct that the therapy at the time may change. The focus may change. You may start with more impairment based therapies. And then as speech becomes a little bit more. I don't like using the word plateau, but as speech becomes a little bit more stable. You might switch to more consequence based therapies. So communication, partner training, um, AAC, those sorts of things, but they can all be done together as well. It depends on the individual. There you go, excellent. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody else online has any other questions. So Josh has put in a question, can my 
speech still improve if I had my stroke 13 years ago and still have aphasia? Um, I think like um, Virginia just mentioned, if you have goals, um, I would encourage you to go to visit at speech pathologies, discuss your goals and the options. Um, I think there's always room for improvement. There might be new um, aphasia and research that has come up that could work and help you achieve your goal of improving your speech. So, yes. Excellent. Is there anything else you would like to add to your presentation prior to us, um, um, I guess, moving on to our next speaker? No, unless there are any other questions. I will just see if there are any other questions. Uh, there we go. Ah, uh, yes, there is another one. Um, do you work with other allied health health professionals in how to work with people with aphasia? Most definitely. So part of our role as speech pathologists, uh, when we're talking about communication partner training, is also working with uh, other members of the allied health team and the doctors to discuss how best to support each individual with aphasia. There was a question earlier in the piece. So when uh, Isabella was uh, speaking about mental health of people with aphasia, uh, one of the people asked whether there were, whether Prozac, I believe, was beneficial for people with aphasia. Now, certain drugs are being studied for the treatment of aphasia. Uh, so drugs that may improve blood flow to the brain or enhance its recovery, um, replace some of the chemicals in the brain, the neurotransmitters, but more research really is needed in these areas. Okay, excellent. Um, and I guess the other question that did come out of um, Isabella's um, talk this morning was the issue of mood disorder and how that impacts recovery per se. But because, you know, there seems to be a real dearth of, of um, treatment um, in regards to people with aphasia, I'm just wondering if you'd like to comment on how uh, the, the treat, um, how mood disorders, I guess, can impact uh, speech therapy going forward. Well, similar to what uh, Isabel was saying earlier, basically, if you've got low mood, so if you're not feeling 100%, it's going to impact on your ability to participate. So actually do the therapy and your ability to learn from it. OK, so okay. that's how it's going to impact your therapy and your progress. And it's why it's important, as Isabella mentioned, that the social worker the speech pathologist and the psychologist work closely together. Excellent. OK. OK, so I've got another question that says my mother is um, 85 with severe aphasia. Is there any therapy for her? Is she likely to regain her speech? Mm. Um, so in terms of therapy, I guess um, a comprehensive speech assessment and language assessment is required. By the looks of it, um, if, if her mum has severe aphasia, perhaps AAC, um, one of the therapy approaches that we spoke about um, during the presentation could be an appropriate one for her. But obviously, um, I think it's, it's needed to have that assessment and have that discussion with the speech pathologist. In terms of improving their speech as such. I'm not sure I have met her mum. Every person is different, but there's definitely room for improving communication as a whole. Um, we don't just communicate with our speech. We communicate with gestures, um, you know, facial expression. And, and that's something that if it's still um, a, a positive that her mum has, we could, that, that's something that we could utilise. Um, to enhance communication. OK, 
Okay, thank you. So I guess that brings us to the conclusion of that session today, which has been extremely good, can I say, and I really did enjoy the way you presented. Uh, it was exceptionally well done and uh, your emphasis on words was was clear and made it, I think, much easier for people who experience uh, communication issues post-stroke um, as well. So thank you very much to you both for your time this afternoon and uh, I look forward to catching up to you uh, in the near future. <laughs>